Fixate on Code, episode 20. All right, Larry Boita here, and you are listening to Fixate on Code, the weekly bite-sized podcast where I talk to the best devs about their favorite strategies for writing great code. Now, let's chat with today's featured guest, Amy Knight. Amy, thanks for joining me today. Hi, thanks for having me. Before becoming a full-stack JavaScript developer, Amy spent 15 years as a competitive figure skater. The grit and hard work required for her former career has made Amy a force in the web development world. With her work on the JS Jabber podcast, creating developer meetups, and speaking on stage, Amy is passionate about helping junior developers make careers for themselves. Amy, can you fill in some of the gaps in that intro and tell me a little bit about what you get up to when you're not writing code? <laughs> for sure. Um, so yeah, like you said, I used to um, figure skate for uh, a huge portion of my life. Uh, it, it was really my life. Um, and so now, you know, I'll, I'll kind of always be an athlete. Now I'm a big runner. Uh, I lift a lot of weights. Uh, so, you know, when I'm not in front of the keyboard, that's probably what I am doing most. And um, like you said, I really, really enjoy like working with the community and helping newer developers. So uh, I try to stay active like in any way I can, just helping people, um, whether they want to like give their first talk or, you know, they're debating about whether or not they want to get into programming and uh, stuff like that. How do you make a transition from skating for 15 years at a competitive level to becoming a developer? How does, how does that decision come about? Yeah, it's not the normal progression there. After I kind of got done skating, you know, I coached a little bit in college uh, and I ended up just in um, like various marketing roles and like marketing slash project management. And it was in those roles that I was working with um, some developers and we had a site that was written uh, in Expression Engine, which is like PHP. Um, it's a lot like WordPress. Uh, but the company had, uh, they'd relocated um, and it had been like almost a year or so, maybe more. Uh, and the developers still hadn't gotten a chance to like go in and update the contact information. And so, um, like I said, I was doing like marketing slash project management. So we had like our kind of like daily standups and, um, you know, it was on my list every day to check in, like, you know, are you going to get a chance to do this? And, and I just got tired of asking. Um, and I decided to go home one day and like figure it out myself. And, uh, after that I was hooked. Uh, so the developers that I worked with, they were really nice. I'm actually like still in touch with a lot of them. And, um, you know, they encouraged me to pursue programming. Like it was, it was a very intimidating thing for me. And, you know, as somebody who grew up as an athlete, um, you know, I wasn't heavily focused on academics for most of my life. I was an athlete. Mm. Uh, so I was always, you know, focused on that kind of stuff. Um, it was something I had never considered, but I, I just like fell in love with it. So what are you most passionate about as a developer? Oh, man. <laughs> um, you know, for me, I think, uh, like, I love the community aspect of it. It's hard for me to say because I still, um, you know, like, I've thought about maybe transitioning into, like, different types of roles as a developer. But um, as much as I love community, like, I still love, like, going, like, heads down and, and programming. Um, so, uh, like, what I'm most passionate about, I guess, like, it's kind of like a rush when you are able to deliver something to someone <laughs> and they are pleased with, uh, you know, what you've produced. So, uh, so that. And then also, just as a developer, like, I've always loved deep diving into things. I'm a really big fan of Kyle Simpson mm -hmm. um, and how he's, like, really deep dive into JavaScript. And so, um, like, Last year and this year, like I've really um, tried to deep dive into CSS. So that's like super interesting to me too. How have you found the whole learning curve on CSS? A lot of devs, I think, discard CSS as like a toy language. But I think a lot of that comes from the difficulty of understanding CSS in comparison to, um, to a proper programming language. How have you actually found adopting CSS and going deep into it? Yeah. Um, so the reason that I first, you know, got really like interested in it. So I was working full stack for most of my career and I used to switch to um, Warner Brothers. And while I was at Warner Brothers, you know, I was just doing front end. Um, and in the past, you know, I kind of like JavaScript was the part that really mattered. Um, as long as the functionality was there, as long as the CSS looked good, um, it didn't matter if it matched like pixel perfect to whatever, you know, you got from a designer. But when you work for a company like Warner Brothers, 
um, their brand is just as important as like your JavaScript. Uh, so I got really frustrated because I wasn't able to like systematically debug or figure things out with CSS like I was with my JavaScript. Mm. And for me, whenever um, I hit that, I always want to like really deep dive into it. So that's why I got interested in it. And I think um, there's probably, you know, multiple reasons, I think, why people tend to dismiss it. You know, I was one of those people. And one of the reasons is, you know, for a lot of developers, you know, the CSS can just be good enough. So Mm -hmm. when they get frustrated, um, instead of like figuring out why, they just kind of like, again, you know, I was guilty of this myself. Like I would Mm -hmm. just, you know, start with the rhetoric of like, you know, CSS is stupid. And, um, (laughs) but again, too, it's, it's a markup language. It's not a programming language. Mm -hmm. So, so that too. And then also like CSS, you have to think about it very differently from when you're using a programming language. Like if you're using JavaScript, um, like global variables are usually a code smell. Um, Mm -hmm. usually not always, but, um, but with CSS, um, like you want global variables because you, you usually want the cascade. Like that's a core component to how CSS works. Mm. Uh, anyway, so yes, all those things. (laughs) (laughs) All right, Amy, can you tell me about the worst experience you've ever had on a project? Oh man. (laughs) Yes, for sure. Um, (laughs) I would say, and you know, everybody, and I think this is different for different people, depending on, you know, what environment you really thrive in. And for me, like, I think from the skating, um, it really, my, my personality is somewhat, um, like structured and disciplined. And, um, so I really thrive in environments like that. And, um, at one point I was in an environment where it was like, you know, a a startup and we were like trying to get stuff out the door as quickly as possible. A lot of times, like not even knowing, Um, if it was exactly the feature that the users wanted yet. And so writing code quickly and um, without testing and stuff like that, that was really difficult for me. And and when you write code like that, you know, the problem that we were facing, the team was facing there at the time was that um, without those tests in place, uh, you know, we we did on-call rotations, um, we'd get woken up pretty frequently mm-hmm. in the middle of the night, like at least a couple of times a week um, in the middle wow. of the night and then maybe, you know, multiple times during the day. So although I learned a ton in that situation, um, it, it wasn't my most favorite working environment. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, I mean, I try to, I try to like make the most of everything, but yeah. <laughs> what, do, what do you think was the biggest takeaway you got from, from having gone through that? Yeah. Um, so the startup, like they, they were doing some really cool stuff. Like they were working with some really cool technology. Um, like they were really ahead of the curve as far as technology. So, so that was, that was awesome that I was learning those things. But for me, like the takeaway that I got from that was work. And when you're actually like producing software for an organization and you're getting paid to do it, um, is not always the time to experiment with the latest technology. Mm-hmm. I think like when you're at work, you, you really want to build like a solid product and spend your time in the most wise way possible there rather than like spending your time at work, like reading through documentation of the newest library or something like that. You know, for me, uh, like spending my time writing tests and, and making sure the features that I, I was building were solid and so yeah, I mean, I mean, it's hard in a startup because you don't always know if like what you're building is what the users need. But um, again, like I would say, you know, if it was up to me, like I would rather, uh, if if I was given like an extra hour on a project, I'd rather spend that time um, making sure the feature was solid and even just manually mm-hmm. tested, uh, and and using maybe even like an older technology that I knew really well. Mm-hmm versus spending that extra hour like researching new technology and configuring like a new tool or then I'm not spending that extra hour um, hardening the feature. <laughs> yeah, and fighting yourself down a rabbit hole. Yeah. Now in terms of getting quality work done on a daily basis, which method or tool do you use that you'd hate to be without? <laughs> yeah, I love this question and I feel like <laughs> my answer might be somewhat different from a lot of people. Uh, but going back to uh, my time as an athlete, I would say like my morning runs are really my hammock time and (laughs) that is the tool like I can't go without. I I would say at least like 90% of the time um, I 
go ahead and like solve what I know I need to work on that day on my morning run. And then when I sit down at the computer, it's just a matter of like coding it out. I've already like thought through exactly what I need to do. So that's what I couldn't live without. Um, Have you heard of Barbara Oakley's learning how to learn course? I have. I haven't like dug into it, but I've heard of it. That's that's a massive aspect is going on runs or going on walks and and entering that diffuse mode and then you sit down. And, and then you're fine. And, and Alan Turing is known for, for having done the exact same thing. Somebody told me, somebody did tell me that actually recently. Yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. That's a, that's a pretty cool parallel over there. <laughs> In terms of new projects, libraries, or frameworks, what are you most excited about at the moment? Uh, so there's something called Houdini. So going back to the time that I've been uh, kind of playing around with CSS and stuff like that, so uh, Houdini is this task force that's being you know, organized from a lot of different uh, browser vendors, and they are creating a set of APIs. So right now, the rendering engine, you know, we can hook into our JavaScript and do things to our JavaScript, uh, but with CSS, you have no real hook-ins into that rendering engine. But Houdini mm-hmm. is, um, they're working on creating these set of APIs that you can hook into that rendering engine process. So rather than like using something like Bootstrap uh, to try to like normalize like cross-browser differences, um, you can do that with Houdini. Um, and we'll be able to like invent new features, wow. um, polyfill features, stuff like that. So uh, that's what I'm really excited about. This sounds like it might tie into WebAssembly or is it something completely um, that won't rely on WebAssembly at all? I don't think so because this is literally just um, exposing a set of APIs so that um, you can hook into like the rendering engine process. So when the browser parses your style sheets and stuff like that, you know, it has to go through, um, it it first creates this thing called the CSS object model, which Mm -hmm. which is a lot like the DOM. Uh, and then it mashes the DOM CSS object model together to create a render tree. Then it goes through like layout, paint, and composite. And so uh, Houdini is going to allow you to do different things within that rendering pipeline. And we're going to have support from all the major vendors. Uh, that's what they're working towards. You know, there's it's it's not there's not a ton out there yet about what all they're doing. Um, but that's the goal. <laughs> that's awesome. That's uh, I think I think there'll be a lot of gratitude for for something like that, especially in the CSS world. I think so. With all the new languages and specs and libraries that are coming out, how do you decide on what to learn and how do you make time to learn? Yeah, uh, again, <laughs> so um, I think early on in my career, like I, like, I just try to do everything um, and that's not always, always the best. So um, like you were saying earlier, I think like the key is to learn how to learn. And that is probably something that you will never master and you're just always going to tweak and refine. So for me, like, how do I decide what to learn? A lot of times it'll parallel kind of like what I'm doing at work. Um, So this year I'm kind of, I'm actually in the process of, I'll be starting a new job uh, in January. So I'm not sure when this comes out, but I'm leaving Warner Brothers and uh, I won't be front end anymore. I'm going back to full stack. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I plan to like focus more on backend. Uh, so along with that, like one of my goals for 2018 is to learn Rust. Uh, so like taking like a completely different path from like front end and hardcore focusing on CSS. Now I want to jump back to the back end. Uh, so I just like pick stuff that I'm, that excites me because that's what, you know, I know will carry me forward, but you know, what's exciting and, and two, what's going to, you know, help me contribute more at work because I do get, I, I get, I really enjoy like, you know, doing good work. I just like my personality, like I want to do a good job at work. Um, And how do I find the time? That's something too, as I've gotten like further into my career, um, I feel like I've become better and better at finding a balance. Uh, So I do on the weekends, try to step away from the computer and just kind of, I'll say, quote unquote, like be a normal person. (laughs) Um, Like, yeah, I'll like hang out with developers and stuff like that. But I also have a lot of friends that like hardly know anything about programming. Mm. Um, So like go to the lake or just spend time outside. Um, But then too, usually like Sundays are kind of my day to curl up and sit back down on my computer and play with stuff. How, having come from a completely different background, when you started becoming adept at programming, did you did you notice how it changed your thinking and and how it changed your interactions with people? Yes. Oh my gosh, it it definitely did. I actually had this conversation with one of my friends Lori at lunch on Saturday. Um, 
it has changed my thinking in so many ways, whether it be like my thought process um, and the community, because I think the community, um, there are a lot of people in the community that are very welcoming and accepting and um, it's a very diverse community. So that has really influenced my thinking as well. So these are like outside of technical things. The other thing is, um, you know, being a, a, a quote unquote woman in tech mm. or whatever. Um, like I don't, I don't always like to get, get super into that kind of stuff, but I have had to uh, learn to speak up a little bit more and, and be a little bit more assertive with my comments and, and stuff like that. So um, that's affected my, my personality for sure. Solving problems, I would say I've really probably become a much more patient person in a lot of aspects of life because, you know, I think programming requires an immense amount of patience. Mm-hmm. You're going to fail a lot of times before you get the right answer. Uh, so I've always been really good at being persistent, but I haven't always been the greatest at being patient and like calmly mm-hmm. breaking down a problem. So that's something that uh, I've gotten better at as a developer. And so it's also improved my ability to do that in life. So which now talking about programming specifically, which specific aspects has dramatically changed the way that you think about and write code? Um, okay, so two things here. So definitely uh, functional programming. You know, I haven't gone like, you know, full on, you know, like written a ton of Haskell or, or anything like that. Like I've played with it a little bit, but um, definitely functional programming because I think, I, I feel like anybody who, like any newer developers really should start experimenting with it because I think it's going to help clean up your code. Like I, I, I'm not one of those people who thinks like, you can only use object-oriented programming or you can only use functional programming, but learning both is going to improve you on on both sides. So along with that, one thing that I think I didn't realize early on and I wish a lot of newer developers could come to the realization quickly is that because like in our industry, people really like to speak in absolutes and as programmers, we like things that are ones and zeros. We like things that are black and white, but hardly anything in life is like that. So the, the, one of the big things I've learned is there's always going to be trade-offs. And so uh, it's not usually like there's a right or wrong answer. It's about um, having a, like a discussion around what are the trade-offs and, and it's not, it's not like an easy prescription, like a pure function or something like, you have to actually like go back and forth and, and examine what these trade-offs are and, and analyze things and figure out, you know, what is the actual end goal? And um, based on the end goal, figure out what solution you're going to go with. Yeah, I think it's so easy to get stuck in some sort of dogmatic point of view. But there's also, there's, there's so many outside factors to yes. people not wanting to learn new frameworks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that too, that too. Oh, there's there's yeah. like that hashtag on Twitter that people use, like junior dev for life, because I think like junior developers, they have that, like they're they're very they're usually pretty open. Yeah, it's about keeping a bit of an open mind. And with that, we've come to the end of our first segment. I'm about to throw some quick fire questions your way. Let's do this. What is the best advice about programming that you have ever received? I'm going to go back to exactly what I just said. Um, One of the mentors that I worked with for a long time, um, he really just kind of like drilled home to me that you you want to not shy away from communicating uh, what various trade-offs are and and that, you know, there are not like black and white solutions. Everything is a trade-off. Which personal habits do you attribute to writing better code? (laughs) Again, definitely that morning run. That is my hammock time. (laughs) (laughs) If you could recommend one book on programming, what would it be and why? Uh, the You Don't Know JS series by Kyle Simpson. Hands down, uh, the absolute best. Mm-hmm. Even I think if you're not like, even if you don't do a ton of JavaScript every day, um, his style of breaking down um, and going really deep, I absolutely love it. Have you taken a look at Kyle's latest book, uh, Functional Light? Yes, yes. It, it's all great. I can't say enough good things about his material. I love it. <laughs> yeah, his, his, his work is absolutely phenomenal. Who in the front-end world is doing work that's really inspiring? I'm going to go back to Kyle Simpson again. <laughs> like, <laughs> everybody has like their programming hero. Um, I've been fortunate enough to meet him, and he's like a great guy. I love him. Um, but yeah, <laughs> Kyle Simpson, like, he's, he's the one that I just admire the most. So <laughs> yeah. just, just for so many things, like for his technical content, um, and then too, just for, uh, he's such a proponent for thinking outside the box and diversity and 
Um, I, I love that he's not afraid to challenge people on their thinking. Mm. Now, Amy, imagine you wake up and you have no recollection of ever having written code. With your knowledge of tools, books, and courses available today, how would you go about learning to program from scratch? <laughs> um, my answer is probably going to reflect my experience. I still think getting started in JavaScript is pretty good. I Now that we have classes and things like that in JavaScript, I would say um, you could go ahead and go with JavaScript all the time. For me, I jumped to Ruby to kind of learn more object-oriented programming. And then I jumped back to JavaScript. But I think now JavaScript has evolved enough that you could stick with JavaScript the whole time. Uh, and then like <laughs> the third time, I'm just going to, I'm going to go with like Kyle Simpson stuff. I think, <laughs> you know, different people will say different things. But for me, uh, learning the basics before I learn a framework is what I would recommend. So learn the basics of JavaScript and then learn the framework. Mm. So the fundamentals you're going to be able to use in any library or framework. Yeah, exactly. Now, Amy, let's wrap up with your top tip on how to work smart and then the best way to connect with you. <laughs> yeah, so how to work smart. Um, I think make sure you have a healthy balance. So um, I think writing good code is not just about um, like how much information you can cram in your brain. I think it's to be smart about it, uh, to make sure that you are leading like a pretty healthy lifestyle. You're getting enough sleep. Um, you have, you know, good friends in your life, good family. Uh, you're getting some exercise. You're eating pretty well. Uh, I think then you're going to be able to produce the best code you can. Uh, as far as getting in touch, you can reach me on Twitter at, at Amy, A-I-M-E-E -E, underscore night with a K. Uh, from there, I think I have my website and uh, on my website, I have a bunch of different like podcast interviews I've done and uh, some talks that I've given. So the, um, the talk for newer developers and then uh, if you're working for newer developers, advice for you. And then uh, my recent talk, uh, the deep dive into CSS and debugging CSS. Awesome. To everyone out there, you've been hanging with Amy Knight and Larry Buerta. Head over to fixate.it where you'll find links and timestamps for everything we've been chatting about today. And Amy, thank you for sharing your journey with Fixate on Code today. Keep pushing the limits and keep pushing great code. Awesome. Thank you. It was a pleasure.